Remain standing. I'm going to be reading from Revelation uh, chapter 15, beginning at verse 5, and then we'll be looking at verse 1 and verse 17 of Revelation 16. You will definitely want a Bible uh, to follow along. If you didn't bring your own, I'd encourage you to do that, but grab the Blue Pew Bible that is in front of you, and you can share it uh, a bit later as we move through the text. So beginning at chapter 15, verse 5, this is John's vision. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. It's been an amazing weekend. Um, Friday late afternoon, I got to kick off the weekend with the women of our church who were at uh, their retreat. I'm so thankful for all of you who were there and all who were praying for it. I think there was 160 or so women there in the fellowship hall as I had the privilege of sharing about Extending Christ, holding out the wonder of who Jesus is, the one who has saved us for all eternity. And to think about this afternoon where we will come together, whether a few or many, to pray and ask the God that you just heard about to overwhelm us with his presence and to heal us from physical ailments, spiritual ailments, relational brokenness, whatever it is, friends, I encourage you to come. If you only have a few minutes, we will lay hands on you and pray over you. We all have prayer needs. You might think yours is small. It's not to God. He cares. So come at four here in the sanctuary. If you're new to our church, I want to tell you the truth. We talk about the wrath of God every Sunday. And not necessarily as specific as you are hearing it from this text, but we have to. Because if there is nothing like this as it relates to God's justice and sin, then there is no good news. And we talk a lot about the good news. But it's good news because those who are in Christ have been saved from the horror of what in God's justice we will read as we move through chapter 16 of Revelation. When we read about God's wrath in the Bible, it's very tempting for Christians to want to distance themselves from that attribute of God, and it is an attribute. And it's understandable. Listen to the first bowl of wrath, verse 2, 16-2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. Again, this is the bowl of God's wrath. And harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second bowl, verse 3, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third bowl, verse 4. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. So you begin to get a picture of the seriousness of God. And if you know anything of the Old Testament, you begin to see, and we've said this from the beginning in Revelation, as much as we think it's about the future, it's always calling us to look backwards to the past. And these plagues, these bowls of wrath, mirror very closely the picture of the ten plagues in Exodus. Christians throughout the history of the church have praised God for all of his attributes. All of God's attributes are holy because he's holy. Everything he does, every part of who he is, is holy. So his love is holy. 
His presence is holy. His power is holy. His justice is holy. And his wrath is holy. But today, many people, including those in the church, really want to distance themselves from the wrath of God. They don't find it comforting to talk about. And they, in some cases, often are embarrassed by people who would say, the very reason I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ is because of the wrath of God. Not just in the book of Revelation, but that's seen throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. There's an atheist named Richard Dawkins who in 2006 wrote a book called The God Delusion. And he equates teaching children about the punishment of sin and uh, eternal hell as the worst form of child abuse, saying it's even worse than a child being molested. Graphic, but that's his perspective. He can't imagine that a God would truly be a God of wrath. A lot of people in the church, though, who would be offended by that statement, still, when confronted by others who question the wrath of God, want to distance themselves from it or to dilute it, to make it less than it is. It's not really this bad. Or they wanted to deny it outright. This isn't new. It's been happening for a long time. 1937, H. Richard Niebuhr wrote The Kingdom of God in America. This is what he said. What's being promoted today is a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. I'm going to read it again. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Because the cross wouldn't be necessary. That's not Christianity. Misunderstanding the attributes of God, all of them, is dangerous theology. And understanding rightly what is meant by the wrath is really important. I want to spend a little time here, and here's why. Sometimes we have a difficult time believing that two things can be true at the same time. In this service, we began by listening to a piece of music, powerfully played, and the title was, What Wondrous Love Is This? God is love. His word says so. He's perfect in love. He's wholly set apart in his love. There is no love like his. He demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still subject to his wrath, he sent his one and only son to die for us. God is love. And God is also a God who is just. Everything he does is just. In God's holiness, he reveals to us that he hates and intensely hates sin. Wayne Grudem defines God's wrath that way in his systematic theology. He says, God's wrath is simply this. He intensely hates all sin. And he does, and he must. Grudem's helpful. He says, what would it be like if he did not hate sin? That means either he would simply delight in it, and we know that's not true, or at least would not be troubled by it. And he is greatly troubled because he hates anything that goes against his character, anything that goes against who he is, and he's a holy God. So in his holiness, in his justice, because man fell, man rejected God, man turned away from God, there had to be justice paid. There had to be a sacrifice, a lamb, and that lamb is Christ. So two things are true at the same time. 
when people come to you and say, well, if you believe in a God of wrath, I can't believe that. I only believe in a God of love. We have a God who is full of perfect love, and he never will not be. And we have a God who is full of perfect wrath until that wrath is satisfied. In fact, if you look back at Revelation 16, go to verse 5 and listen to what the angels are saying after the third bowl is poured out. Verse 5, 16, chapter 16, verse 5, And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. We hate that. But it's true. It's what I deserved. It's what we all deserved. I remember preaching in Acts chapter 5 of the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Look it up. Ananias and Sapphira lie about what they've done with their money. They both die. They drop dead. I remember preaching that years ago, and I was nervous about it. I was like, ugh, it truly is God's word. We talk about preaching all of God's word until the Lord made it very clear to me. It's what they deserved. And it is. That's what's amazing about the gospel. We all deserve that, every one of us. The God of love is a God of wrath. And both of those attributes he's holy in. His wrath is never apart from his love. His wrath is never apart from his justice. It's always holy. More than one thing is true at the same time. And we believe that about other parts of our faith. Jesus Christ at the same time and for eternity is 100% man and 100% God. Those two things are true. That's who he is. He is a wrathful God who is just and righteous and holy and loving. And that's what the word teaches. So let's talk for a moment about the recipients of God's wrath. There are three mentioned in the passage. First, go back to verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came up on the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its images. So the first recipients in this chapter of the, of the wrath of God are those who have rebelled against God and continue to do so. They have received the mark of the beast. What that means is they are now forever unrepentant. They did not turn to God as he was proclaimed. The second group is seen in verse 10. It says, The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. So you see the recipients now, this is the trinity of evil. This is the beast, the dragon, the false prophet that we've heard about through the book of Revelation. The wrath is poured out and like those who continue to not repent, they actually curse God and do not repent. The last one is Babylon, which we'll see in just a minute in verse 17. But in 15, verse 15, as we begin to look at the fifth bowl, we hear this. Start with verse 14. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to kings, the whole world, to assemble them for a battle at the great day of God. Verse 15, behold, I am coming like a thief. Notice that's in parentheses. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that they may not go about naked and be exposed. Then verse 16, and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Armageddon. As we move into this part of Revelation, remember, and we've said this from the beginning, there are godly women and men who love the Lord, who seek to honor them with all of who they are, who differ in their understanding of future events. That's just true. God did not tell us everything about the future, and he did not make everything very clear. He made clear what he wanted to make clear, and he left some things that are such a profound mystery. And people land in different places on these, and we must 
hold these things loosely. I tell you that because Armageddon is one of those places where people have a lot of beliefs that, to be honest with you, probably aren't really founded in Scripture. 1998, what was the title of the highest grossing film? Armageddon. Armageddon, starring Bruce Willis, a story of a Texas-sized meteor, asteroid coming to Earth. And the only way they could imagine fixing it was to send up some people who worked in the oil fields, who spent 12 days being trained as astronauts, who were then going to drill into the bottom of this massive asteroid, plant a nuclear bomb, and blow it up. I didn't see the movie. Maybe it was great. It had an amazing cast. Bruce Willis, Billy Bob Thornton, Liv Tyler. But it was fiction. Shocked. <laughs> but it's very possible that much of what you believe about Armageddon might be fiction too. Armageddon is a word. Megiddo means the Mount of Megiddo. Megiddo is an actual place. Every time wars break out in Israel or in the Middle East, Christians begin to wonder, is this even more so the beginning of the end? The headlines from last night about the missiles being fired from Iran and the dome working and the, the, the incredible weapons that protected them. I think it says something like 99% were shielded. Megiddo is a real place. As much attention that has been given to this word Armageddon is really interesting because there's not much said about it. In fact, this is the only place in the Bible, the whole Bible, that this word exists. That's it. Nowhere else. Philip Ryken, who used to serve as pastor of 10th Pres, a historic church in our denomination where James Montgomery Boyce preached so faithfully for a long time. Now, Ryken is the president of Wheaton College. He says, it is not that often that biblical vocabulary becomes part of the popular culture. But these days, Armageddon seems to be generally understood as the battle to end all battles. He writes about it saying, when I was studying and thinking about what Revelation means, and I went back a hundred years or so, there wasn't much written about it. But in our lifetime, so much print has been consumed. Some of it very helpful, but some of it not. And so you really need to know what it is you believe. And then the few minutes we have this morning, we're not going to be able to unpack all that, but there's so many good commentaries that you can read. But what you'll discover is that people who are even of the same stripe in the same denomination, teaching at the same seminaries, don't all agree. And that's because it's not equally clear. Megiddo is a battlefield that is quite remarkable. Napoleon said it was the perfect battlefield. He fought there. Derek Thomas, who spoke here before at Winter Grace, said it was the battlefield of Israel, the battlefield of Israel. Listen to this history. Overlooking it on one side was Mount Tabor, from which Deborah and Barak launched their assaults on the Canaanites. Across the valley was Mount Gilboa, where King Saul was slain by the Philistines. Behind Megiddo itself was Mount Carmel, where Elijah conquered the false prophets of Baal in the service of Jezebel. I have been there. I've seen that. It's amazing. It was in this plain that Gideon blew his trumpet and overthrew the Midianites. It was also here that Israel's last godly king, Josiah, died in the battle with Pharaoh. Derek writes, It is then altogether appropriate that Megiddo should symbolize the location of the battle of the Lord against the forces of darkness in the final cataclysmic battle should be pictured as taking place here. Some believe it's a literal place. Many in the Reformed faith believe it's not a literal place, but it is a real battle. There is going to be this cataclysmic event because God's word speaks to it. Philip Ryken says it is important not to read more into Armageddon than is actually there, but it is equally important to believe what the Bible does teach. One day, Armageddon will be the battle to end all battles. There will be victory. The date is known only to God but God wins. 
God wins. Have you heard the victory of our worship service today, the anthems that we are singing? Let's end by talking about the victory of his wrath. I want you to think about this, which is the title of this sermon, Between Two Cries. Spend some time in 16. Read over every one of these bowls. Try to understand it and remember what I've said about the attribute of wrath and God's holiness and love and justice. But now let's go to verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. Does that sound familiar? This is the third Sunday of Easter. And as we worshiped on Monday Thursday and the last of seven words of Christ were read from the cross in the Greek, Jesus says with a loud voice, Tetelestai, it is finished. He finished what he came to do. He accomplished as our atonement, as the unblemished lamb, the lamb of all lambs, salvation for God's people. And now here, the same man who was with him, who saw him and heard from the cross to tell us die, records this word coming from the same man, Jesus, Gigonin, Gigonin, G-E-G-O-N-E-N. It has come to pass. Between these two cries, Christ on the cross cries out to tell us die, it is finished. Now the last bowl of wrath poured out by a perfect, holy, just God, he says, it has come to pass. It is done. Between two cries, we have the ultimate victory. But it's only for those. This victory is only for those who are in Christ. And so that brings us to two cups. Between two cries, we now speak of two cups. There is the cup of God's wrath and the cup of God's blessing. The recipients of God's wrath were not just those who had the mark of the beast. They were not just the trinity of evil, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. It wasn't just those in Babylon. There was another recipient of God's wrath, and it was his son. And Jesus prayed in the garden before he went to the cross, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will be done, but your will be done. And it was the will of the Father that the Son would drink the cup that you and I should have drunk. But he drank that cup of God's wrath, of God's judgment, so that all who are in Christ would never have to drink it. We are shielded by him, by his righteousness, by his death, by his resurrection, his life, his reign. We won't ever need to say we're 99% shielded. We are fully shielded. None of the wrath will ever touch us. There is no condemnation, not some or maybe a small percentage, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But for those who have not drank the cup of his blessing, then for you, if you never turn to Christ, you will be drinking for all eternity the cup of his judgment and wrath. So I want to leave you with this. In, in the parentheses of verse 15, from the throne we hear, behold, I am coming like a thief in the night. I'm, the night part's not there, but you get it. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and, and be seen exposed. 
Friends, Jesus said this is true, and now he's speaking it. We don't know when he's going to come. And you may be thinking today, I've got lots of time. I'm in high school. I'll get this stuff together after college. I promise you there's people who said that who are now out of college who are not getting serious about the things that we're talking about. Today, you're hearing the truth. You may never hear it again. He's going to come when you don't expect it. If you don't know him and he comes, it will be too late for all eternity. Drink the cup of his blessing today so that you can be with him for all eternity. Simply pray as I close us and we come to the table, Father, forgive me of my sins. I receive and rest in Jesus alone for my salvation. Simply pray that prayer and tell one of us you prayed it. For those of you who know you have already drunk the cup of blessing, when you come to this table, come with joy, but come remembering you deserve the cup of wrath. And a God who's just in that is the one who said, I love you so much that I'm going to have my son drink it for you every drop. Come, take the bread, take the cup, and remember that you are his forever. The table for us today is not a Presbyterian table, but it is a table only for those who have professed faith in Jesus. Today, friend, if you're here and you've not trusted in Jesus, don't come forward. The Bible tells you you would eat and drink judgment on yourself, but listen to the Spirit. Is he speaking to you saying, drink the cup of blessing? Receive me as Lord and Savior. If you want to pray that with me or with Pete or one of our elders, simply let us know. It would be our great delight. Father in heaven, thank you for those two words that Christ proclaimed, one from the cross and one from the inner sanctuary of the heavens. Thank you, Christ Jesus, that you accomplished everything. And thank you that one day we will see you in your glory, and that will be forever. As we come now to the table, bless us, feed us. Let us find great strength and encouragement in the triumph that is ours in Christ Jesus. And Lord, for those today who may be coming to saving faith, today bless them and hear their prayers as they cry out to you, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I rest and receive Jesus alone for my salvation, in whose name we pray, amen.